I went into labor on Saturday, January 20th. And one of the first things I said to Noah after, I think it's happening, and we need to pack a hospital bag. Good sermon for tomorrow. And Noah said, you got to let it go. Our son made his entrance into the world at 10.18 the next day, right about the time I would have been standing in this pulpit. So while I missed that service, and I missed what I'm sure was a really lovely baby shower, thank you. I, I know, I saw pictures, I'm sure it was great. I think we can all agree I was probably where I was supposed to be that morning, with a front row seat to my own little miracle. We don't always get a second chance, but I get one today. I get the chance to preach a a version of that sermon I wrote 15 weeks ago. So indulge me this morning, the lectionary text day, book of Jonah. It's multi-layered, it's action-packed, relatively short. And it's really funny. A man gets swallowed and subsequently spit back up by a giant fish. That's funny. And it's intentionally funny. And that's something we should keep in mind this morning. Because in order to appreciate the book of Jonah and the lessons it has for us, we need to understand something about the type of book it is, its genre. Yes, books of the Bible have genres. Jonah is what's known as a prophetic book. It's one of 17 in the Hebrew Bible, alongside Isaiah, Lamentations, Hosea, and Amos. But Jonah is unlike all of the rest in its structure, and its humorous tone. Jonah is narrative in structure. The other prophetic books center on pronouncements or on a dialogue between the prophet and God. Their focus is on the cause of the prophetic message and on the message itself. The book of Jonah, however, tells a story about a prophet's adventures. And like I said, Jonah is funny. It's written as a satire, actually, with stock characters and exaggerated elements that are designed to make us laugh while simultaneously teaching ethics and offering a social critique. Not only is the book of Jonah a book unlike the other books, Jonah is a prophet unlike all those other prophets. Here's where you can start to see some of that satire at work. On the one hand, Jonah is terrible at his job. He doesn't do what God asks him to do. He's involved in several aquatic mishaps, and he doesn't even seem to understand God's message. And that's sort of part of the job description for a prophet to understand God's message, but Jonah misses the point again and again and again throughout the story. But on the other hand, Jonah might be the most successful prophet in the biblical canon. 
His prophetic work leads to the immediate and total salvation of an entire city. Talk about failing upward. We've got this satirical narrative about a rather ridiculous prophet. And today's section finds him in Nineveh. To remind ourselves how he stories start, right? Once upon a time, the word of God came to Jonah and said, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Jonah does what any respectable prophet would do, and he runs in the opposite direction, boarding a ship to Tarshish. Unfortunately for Jonah, you can't outrun or outsail God. God sends a violent storm that threatens to capsize the ship. The sailors try everything they can think of to prevent a shipwreck. They each pray in their own tradition and they start to throw all the cargo overboard to lighten the load. Meanwhile, Jonah does what any respectable prophet would do in this. Eventually, nothing's working. The captain goes and wakes him up and asks for some assistance. Hey, Jonah, maybe you could also do something. You could pray to your God so that we don't all die. You see, everyone on the ship knows what's going on. They know that Jonah's running away from his God because, like any respectable prophet, Jonah told them that's what he was doing. So everyone knows that Jonah is responsible for the situation. Jonah, he gets it, and he tells the sailors, throw him overboard. The sailors, though, they're, they're good guys. They don't want to send Jonah to certain watery death, so they try as hard as they can to row to shore, but the storm... So in the end, they have no choice, and Jonah is tossed to sea, at which point the storm immediately ceases, and Jonah is swallowed up by a huge fish. Jonah is in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights when he finally, like any respectable prophet, gets around to praying. Think about that. Three days and three nights, and then he starts to pray. I'd, I'd probably start immediately, but that's just me. And his prayer, it's, y'all, it's all over the place. You should go back and read. First, he blames God a little bit for the entire situation, then he thanks God for the fish rescue, and then, towards the end, he, he asks for salvation. Which God provides by commanding the fish to vomit Jonah onto dry land. Speaking to Jonah, saying, go to great city of Nineveh and proclaim the message I give you. This time, like any respectable prophet, Jonah obeys. Nineveh is described as comically large and outrageously evil. It's basically the big bad wolf in the story. But brave little Jonah is in Nineveh will be overthrown. It's a strange prophecy, actually, if you think about it. There's no discussion of why the city will be overthrown. Yes, that they're wicked, but we're never told specifically why. And there's no mention of hope or the possibility of forgiveness. There's just this proclamation of destruction, which is what Jonah wants. 
Jonah wants Nineveh destroyed. He didn't even want to be here in the first place. He sees no hope for the Ninevites, and he wants no hope for the Ninevites. But the author of this story, if we listen closely, gives us a glimpse of a different outcome. You see, the root of the Hebrew word that's used for overthrown It can have more than one meaning. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Hints at the possibility. Forty days, Nineveh will not be destroyed, but will be reformed. And that's exactly what happens, right? The people of Nineveh, they believe Jonah. They believe God. They began to fast, and they put on sackcloth. And incredibly, this repentance, it works its way to the very top. The king of Nineveh, the king, follows the actions of the common people. He, too, covers himself in sackcloth and sits in the dust. The king, the nobility, all the people, even the animals of the city, begin to call urgently on God. Which is a bit ridiculous. I mean, imagine everyone, including, we're told, like the chickens and the cows and the dogs and the cats dressed in sackcloth and sitting in the dust. But remember, remember, what's satire designed to? It's designed to make us laugh while also communicating larger ethical principles through exaggerated social critique. So what is the author here doing by having us imagine some cows in sackcloth? The author is pointing out a need for full repentance from not just individual, but from social sin. The fact that the entire city and all of its people participate indicates that the sin here, the wickedness, it's not just individual actions, but something collective, something structural. It's something that calls for a complete overhaul of institutions and systems and hearts and Scale turn away from sin. It's a complete acknowledgement of wrongdoing and a full-throated cry for forgiveness, a total commitment to change. Let's use our spiritual imaginations this morning to think about what that would mean today. Imagine with me what it would look like for the city of Chicago, from the highest position of power to the everyday citizen to turn around on the topic of homelessness, to say that we as a city will simply not accept a reality where any single person does not have a warm and safe place to stay. Or imagine with me what it would look like for this country from the highest position in the land to the everyday citizen to turn around on the topic of mass shootings, to say no, no, we as a people, we don't accept a reality where children can be killed in their classrooms. Imagine any number of topics, what it would look like, outrageous as it sounds, and then hear what happens next in the story. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, she changed her mind and did not bring on them the destruction she had threatened. God changed their mind. Can that even happen? Can God change his mind? 
It's an open question in the field of theology. Some scriptures say yes. Some scriptures say no. Theologians argue for and against. There's not one right answer. But I can tell you what I think. I believe that our God is a responsive God. I believe that our God is an attentive God. So yes, I believe that God can change her mind. Not in the same way that we might. After all, I'm not going to pretend I know how God's mind works. I believe it works in different and mysterious ways and encompasses far more than I can comprehend. But I believe that God is responsive to our efforts. And I believe that when we turn and we change and we try, that we open up new possibilities for what God wants to do. Today's text from the Gospel of John, it focuses on the love commandment. Abide in my love. Love one another as I have loved you. To love, to truly love, means to be open to change. To love, to truly love, means to be open to the impact that other people will have on our lives. To love, to truly love, means to be open to the ways that we might come to see situations and people differently. Love my infant son so much. And let me tell you, this love has changed me. I'm not the same that I was last time I preached a sermon. Yet while becoming a parent has not been easy, oof, it has not been easy, I do find him easy to love. But that's not always the case, right? As Fred reminded us in his sermon last week, sometimes love is really hard. I think especially so when it requires us to change. That's a lesson that Jonah has for us, the lesson of change and of second chances. Jonah is a story where prophets and people and entire cities are given the chance to try again. It's a story where even God sees new possibilities unfold. Where are we called to do the same? I believe that is one task before us as Christians today. I think we're called to be vulnerable enough, to work at love enough, that we're changed. And while it's not easy, we have things that fuel us and that remind us that this sort of transformation is possible, like the ritual of communion.